Good morning, everyone, and all, all the people on Zoom. It's good to be together again this lovely morning. And it's lovely to have some friends that we haven't had been able to enjoy their company for a little while. So thank you for coming, Carol and David. It's so nice to see Carol looking well, and to Bill as well. And Lord, we just thank you for all your blessings. And I only have one extra notice, and it's a nice one. Sorry, I'm Bill and Mary. I'm sorry, I just getting brain dead trying to think of everything. Um, Anne and Ian have some spare plants. So if you're a gardener, if you're interested in tomatoes, watermelon, sweet melon, broccoli, purple sprouting, savoy cabbage, runner beans, and some more to come. <laughs> so if, if you're wanting uh, any of those, just see Anne or Ian after the service. And now it's, um, excuse me, if we just let the one or two people and join us and feel comfortable. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, hand over to Catherine who is bringing the message today. Thank you. Thank you and good morning and it's lovely to be here with you today. Today is the Sunday between Ascension Day and Pentecost. So we'll be thinking as a focus of our worship this morning, thinking about Christ's ascension to heaven, his return to his heavenly father and thinking of the implications of that for us. So our call to worship. Lord, your word tells us that you want us all to be one in you. So we are here as your family, connected to you and to each other by your blood and by your spirit. And so we worship you. Amen. So our first hymn is a hymn of praise to Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow.
So we bring our prayers of adoration and confession. Let's pray together. Almighty and holy God, we gather as your people to worship you. We're here to praise you for being here among us. We're here to thank you that for all your goodness and greatness, you welcome us into your presence. We've come to declare your faithfulness, to acknowledge your majesty and to marvel at your love for us. And we're here to rejoice. We're here to give our thanks, to express our wonder and to celebrate your goodness. We come in all our weakness and with all our failings, rejoicing that in Christ we have been cleansed and made new, and that through him you have set your mark upon us and called us to be your people. So we ask that you might forgive us when we fail you, our lives betraying our calling in your love. Forgive us when people look at us and instead of seeing something of you, see only ourselves. Forgive us when the things we say and do obscure and deny the gospel rather than proclaim its message to all. Help us truly to be a holy people, reflecting your love, showing your compassion and responding to your guidance. Renew and restore us through the love of God and the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Loving God, accept this time of worship and help us through it to draw nearer to you. Open our hearts to the love of Christ. Open our lives to the movement of your spirit. Open our minds to all that you are and continue to do. And so may we worship you, not just in this short time together, but in every moment of our lives. Touch our hearts and strengthen our faith so that in the week ahead we may live and work for you, for the glory of your name. Amen. So we sing another song of worship. I think this is going to be a new one for some of you, but some of the congregation have been rehearsing it this week and and trying to learn it. And I I hope some of you will know it. All my days, I will sing this song of gladness.
It's a wonderful vision of heaven and Jesus um, return to his rightful place as king of heaven. So we're going to hear our two Bible readings now. First of all, from Acts, which is um, account of the ascension. And then a reading, short reading from John's gospel, which is at the Last Supper. Jesus is praying for his disciples and for all believers who will follow. And he's praying that we might have unity. So we'll hear our readings now. First reading is from Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 6, which is on page 1031 in the Church Bibles. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And the Gospel reading from John 17 on page 1025, reading from verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them.
Thank you, Lee. During the um, COVID lockdowns, we've made promises to ourselves about building back better. Um, we would appreciate life more, we would get out and about more, we would take care of our planet. <laughs> but now as we kind of limp out of the pandemic, many of us are feeling a bit tired because we seem to, you know, we've come through one dreadful time and we're assaulted by a new set of challenges. There's the war in Ukraine, continues to be deeply troubling and worrying. Um, rising prices to the despair that many of us feel about the lack of honesty and integrity of our government. And it's a bit hard to feel optimistic or purposeful. Simply surviving, getting from one day to the next can become the goal. But as Christians, I think we should look a bit beyond that because I'm confident that our Bible readings today can give us cause for hope and reasons to be positive as we look to the future. Now, the time between Ascension Day, which was on Thursday, and Pentecost next Sunday is another of those waiting periods. It's a bit like Holy Saturday between the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's a waiting time. Something has happened and the disciples are waiting for something else. They're waiting for the fulfillment of a promise. In this case, they're waiting for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It's a bit like amber on a traffic light. You used to have flashing amber, didn't you? But I don't think you get a flashing amber anymore, do you? That's it got people a bit too um, carried away. We now have red and amber, don't we? Red and amber means get ready to go from stop to go but just wait until literally you get the green light so that's what this period between ascension day and pentecost may be certainly for the first disciples get ready but wait it's the ascension that marks the conclusion of the incarnation in the incarnation, God in Jesus took our human nature, was born on earth. And in the ascension, Jesus Christ took that human nature back to heaven. So it's the ascension rather than the crucifixion and the resurrection that's the culmination of, of that event of the incarnation. And of course, through the ascension of Jesus Christ, Humanity is now in heaven, but it's wounded humanity because Jesus bore the scars of his crucifixion into glory. And before he leaves, Jesus commissions his disciples to carry on his work. There are 11 men named in our Acts reading, but we're also told there were women there and other men who were with him. And, and the commission was given to all of them, not just the men who were named. And of course, it comes to us as we inherit that commission. And there's a lot of movement in this story. There's the looking upwards, there's the heading downwards, and then there's the setting outwards. So let's first look at looking upwards and the puzzling question of where did Jesus go? And are we meant to understand it literally or not? Did Jesus actually disappear up out of sight like a, a space rocket or a, a helium balloon? If you look at the gospel writers, they each describe the ascension in a slightly different way. And in fact, it's, it's only Luke who tells us very much about it at all. And he gives us two accounts. There's one at the end of his gospel and the one we've just heard <clears throat> from the beginning of Acts. And the one at the end of his gospel 
suggests that the ascension happened very close in time to the resurrection. He writes this, when he, Jesus, had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to the Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. But the account that we heard in Acts is very clear that it was 40 days later. And it's this one mention of 40 days that has determined the church's liturgical calendar. And Matthew and Mark don't mention the ascension at all. And John's gospel doesn't have an ascension story, but our reading from chapter 17 is very much a marking of an end of one venture and the beginning of another. As the unity of Jesus with his heavenly father is affirmed, and Jesus is speaking as if he's already left the world. It's actually worth finding time to read the whole of that chapter, chapter 17, as Jesus prays for himself and his disciples and for all believers. And in chapter 20 of John's Gospel, the resurrection and ascension seem to take place on the same day. And Jesus tells Mary at the tomb, I am returning to my father. And that same day, he fills his disciples with the Holy Spirit. Whereas Luke makes the disciples wait seven weeks for the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And Paul writes of how Jesus is now at God's right hand. In other words, he's with God in heaven. So you might say to me, well, if they're all saying different things, what did it happen? And does it matter? And I think, well, lots of the... Um, um, events in Jesus's life in the Gospels. We take bits from all four of the Gospels and, and create for ourselves a composite story. I mean, the Christmas story is an ideal example of that, where we take bits from all of the Gospels to, to get our overall picture, as it is with our um, accounts of the crucifixion and the resurrection. We take bits from different parts of the Gospels and together they give us the overall picture. So I think the fact that each of these gospel writers tells us something different about the ascension doesn't worry us, shouldn't worry us, it's interesting. And between all four of them, and you know, the, gospel, the account in Acts as well, a fifth account, gives us an overall picture of what happened. But maybe, and I think probably, the mechanics of how it happened and how Jesus returned to heaven are not that important. Because the biblical writers are trying to explain to us something that is difficult to describe and understand. What is important is that the ascension marks the completion of Christ's work on earth. It has to be understood within the context of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. You can't understand one of them without having some understanding of the others. So the ascension is like the last piece in a jigsaw, or it's like the completion of a circle. Jesus is now in heaven. Heaven is where God is, and that's everywhere. Jesus is risen, exalted, glorified. So part of our response to the ascension is worshipping Jesus. Worshipping Jesus now at God's right hand. As we'll sing in our final hymn, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. And if the primary function of the church is to worship God, then it's good that we make worship a priority. It's good that we take time at the beginning of each new week to worship God. And it's important that we make it the best that we can and that we come in the right frame of mind willing to worship God so that it's as good as it can be and that our worship can lift our spirits to God. But just as the angels told the disciples, why are you looking into the sky? 
They can't stay there worshipping forever. And we can't spend all our time worshipping. Because looking upwards leads on to heading downwards. And we're told that the disciples go back to Jerusalem. They regroup, if you like. The named men, together with the women disciples and Mary, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' brothers, we're told that they, they met frequently and they prayed together constantly. And there's a great sense of purpose about their activity. Jesus' work on earth is complete, but it's not over. There's work to be done and they're preparing for it. And meeting together and praying together shows how they recognize the importance of their unity. It echoes John's, um, Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, where he prayed, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. There's a very great encouragement there to us to meet together, to work together, and to pray together as we build up our church and faith community. And Jesus says it's, it's by our unity as Christians that others will know that we belong to him. I think that's incredible. That's an astonishing thing. If we can be unified as Christians, not just in this little group here, but as Christians across the world, in our, in our town, in our country and throughout the world, if we can be unified, then others will know that we belong to Christ. Hmm, sad thing that we haven't always been able to manage that. Sometimes even local communities of Christians can't manage to be, be unified, let alone um, in, a, in a town or a country or across the world. That's something for us to, to work at, because if we can do that, then others will be attracted to that and, and want to join. So we work together towards our unity. But we shouldn't spend all our time doing that, because just as we shouldn't spend all our time worshipping, nor should we spend the rest of our time in church or on churchy business or just with our church friends, because there's a great danger in our looking inward and just concentrating on how we can keep our church going. Because if nothing else, the ascension reminds us that as well as looking upwards and heading downwards, there's a setting outwards. Because Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Wow, that's a long way. And Matthew said, Go to all people everywhere and make them my disciples. So this is our mission imperative as Christians to go to the ends of the earth. Very often we're not even prepared to go to the end of the street to tell people of God's love for them. It's, it's a daunting challenge. Of course, we haven't got to achieve it just by ourselves. But it is a daunting challenge. But we gain strength from a saviour now in the heavens who equips us for his service. Of course, we'll hear more about that next Sunday when we celebrate Pentecost. And the disciples are not empowered to be witnesses until they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we don't have to wait. We can be filled with the Spirit today. And every day we can ask for that infilling. But it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit which enables us to be witnesses. And being witnesses doesn't have to be difficult. Jesus gives us plenty of examples of simple conversations that led to opportunities to share a nugget of faith. And, and we can do that. I mean, think about a, a faith connection in a, in a television program you watch and, and look for an opportunity to sharing that in a conversation. We'll take opportunities to, 
to tell other people what's good about your faith or what's good about your church, our church, and see if you can find that way of sharing it with others. And maybe what's good about it is, is knowing that you're loved by God and the assurance that that gives to you. Maybe it's, it's the joy of belonging to a lovely community and having friends that you meet here week by week. Maybe what gives you um, strength in your faith is the, is the hope of heaven and, and something to look forward to in the future. Maybe it's the opportunity to work for justice or for a better world. And if you appreciate being a Christian and, and knowing that you're loved by God, and you know that it makes a difference to your life, maybe it could make a positive difference to someone else's life. And, and you could be brave enough or show you care enough to tell them about it. Of course, they might not be interested. That's the risk that we take. But there's something important to you. Maybe it could be important to them as well. Because being a witness is simply telling someone else what I know to be true. And that's how the good news is spread. And it's up to the people we talk to whether they want to respond or not, and whether the, the Holy Spirit will be at work in them. So the Ascension celebrates the return of Jesus to heaven. He's no longer confined to one time and place and he passes his work and mission on to his followers. And we look upwards to worship the glorified Saviour. We look downwards to meet and pray together in community. And we set outwards to share God's love and our conviction of Jesus risen, exalted and glorified. Amen. So we sing our next hymn, the hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine, Lord, the light of your love is shining.
Commit our nation into your holy hands. We give you praise and adoration for the life of our Queen. We pray for our government. May they seek your guidance in their actions. Give them the wisdom to effectively tackle the financial and social challenges of our nation. Award them with the intellect to work with other nations to bring an end to these challenges. Love and Lord, praise you, Lord. Lord, have mercy on our world. Comfort families who lost loved ones in the Texas shooting. Bring an end to gun violence in the world. Intervene in wars and in the lives of those displaced worldwide. May peace prevail in Ukraine. Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, and Sudan. Lord of all openness, lead your people forward with a light step and a courageous heart. Love and Lord, we praise your holy name. Lord of hope and faithfulness, we cast the cares of our loving children in your compassion onto your hands. Answer your, their call and heal them of all their illnesses and worries. We remember especially Vivian, Xavier, Ernest, members of the Triple Girl Guild who meet in our building, Francis's stepdaughter and husband, and Moni, Beryl, Bonnie, Fiona. This is as can see. Father, may your will be our bread, your grace our strength, and your love our resting place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. So we finish our time together with our final hymn, which is the great hymn of praise to the ascended Jesus. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne.
and strengthen in our connection, not only with each other, but also with you. So send us out now in your name and in your power to continue to live lives that are pleasing to you. Amen. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon each one of you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.